All right, folks. Three, episode three. Happening in three, two, one. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Happy Hour with Louis Q. Today, it is the 1 a.m. actually. I'm a night owl today. It is May 11th, 2020. And here we go. Let's get right into it, y'all. So, restaurants are reopening slowly all over the country. And uh, what are we seeing? What's going on? I think today I really wanted to take the time to talk about two things uh mainly you know how the curbside model is working out for some restaurants and um going forward how this changes not only the curbside model but now our dine-in model and also how restaurant management has been handled uh since i don't even know how long but uh we'll we'll, we'll go ahead and get into that uh but first i just wanted to kind of cover how the current curbside model is working out for us you know we're having to figure out what is what in our menus are worth uh first of all putting out there for our guests right uh which menu items we have that are going to one stay warm longer uh two taste really well after sitting out for a little while right because people are going to be waiting in their cars and then you know three you can make a profit off of um and you can execute most importantly rapidly Right, you don't want those dishes that are, that take 20 minutes to cook because, you know, right now time is of the essence. I think this is a very interesting time right now for restaurants because it doesn't matter whether you're uh, a Carabas, a Olive Garden, a, a Longhorn, a, a, your local Mexican restaurant, a, a sports bar, a Hooters, or whatever. Everyone now is on the same playing field, and what I mean by that is. Now is the time when people are trying to figure out who's going to be the most efficient. You know, right now it doesn't matter how good your steak is if it takes you 30 minutes and then me to sit in your line for 20 minutes just to get that steak, right? I want to find out right now which restaurants are going to be able to provide me the best quality meal for my money um, at a rapid rate. So I think now that we're all on a level playing field, we have to really go out, think outside the box and figure out just how the hell we're gonna separate ourselves. And I think a big one comes from uh, executing that curbside model uh, uh, super efficiently, okay? Um, What do I mean by that? I mean, so at my restaurant, we just opened up. Uh, We've been curbside for about two-ish weeks now, and we're learning as we go. We're having to figure out how do we, you know, first of all, we, we shrunk our menu uh, we no longer have our lamb chops. We no longer have half the stuff that we're really known for. But uh, we still have fajitas. Fajitas, I mean, if you're constantly cooking the chicken, it doesn't take that long to chop it up and put it out. Where the issue comes is when you start to mix in quesadillas, when you start to mix in tacos with that. So if we're going to be super efficient, we have to figure out every single aspect of the dining experience. Or not the dining experience, but of this curbside model. Uh, what do I mean by that? That's from the second that our guest drives into the parking lot, are they taking the longest route to our, wherever we are to go, our curbside area is? Uh, How are you directing traffic as far as what if I called ahead and I already paid on the phone versus whether I'm just going to place my order there at the restaurant? How are we separating those two and how are we going about making sure that the person that's already paid is getting their food the second they pull up and say, hi, my name is John Doe. And then while also making sure that the person that happens to come up and just place their order on the spot isn't waiting 20 minutes, isn't waiting 30 minutes. Um, Then you got to take it into the dining room, right? Are you prepared for however many people are coming through the restaurant or coming through your curbside area? Are your servers in position? So do you have somebody up front greeting? Do you have someone in the kitchen bagging? Do you have, do you have someone, um, I don't know, assisting with uh, the side dishes? Do you have somebody making sure that uh, they're checking everything? You have a manager in place at the front 
in the kitchen, making sure that the execution is going flawlessly. Um, what if they need extra silverware, extra plates? Do you have that, you know, all the way in the kitchen in the storage room, or do you have that up front? So figuring out exactly what you're going to need, how and how you're going to execute going by, going about that is really what's going to make these experiences night and day between restaurant to restaurant. I think now is the time where we really get a chance to build guests, to really earn these guests that might have never tried our food before. Let's say they've already gone to the restaurant across the street and they've ended up waiting 45 minutes. And then they say, you know what, let's just go try you know, this restaurant across the street. We've been meaning to go to it. We just never actually had the time to go or we just never wanted to go, blah, 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 blah. If they pull into your parking lot and they're able to place an order at ease, so whether that's being online, whether that's being over the phone, however you want to do it, if that experience goes smoothly for them and they try it again and it goes smoothly again and they come back one more time, that third time is when you get that real opportunity to get that guest in. Now, you just earn that, that guest. So for however long we're doing this curbside model, you're probably going to be their number one choice for a quick meal. Okay, you know this is not including, let's say they're really craving something, you can't control what they're craving, but when they do decide to say, let's get curb, let's get takeout, let's get somewhere that's good that we know is gonna be super fast and efficient, they're gonna come to you. All right, um, I talked about apps in the last podcast and I'm still really big on that. I, I think being able to go online and utilize, you know, hey, Mr. Quinones, your last order was this. Would you like to replace your order? That ease of purchase, you already have my credit card saved. I'm earning a rewards point uh, for, you know, or ordering from you guys. That... I really think that's something that we should be looking at, but if you want to take a listen on how I feel about that, take a look at our, at our last podcast. Oh, excuse me, guys. God. I got a little uh, Wild Turkey 101. Help me loosen my throat. Not sick. Don't freak out. Not sick. Just a little tired. We had a crazy, crazy weekend last week. Uh, I guess, was it Tuesday? Almost a week ago with Cinco de Mayo and... Um, uh, you know what? Let me take a second to talk about that experience because I think it's it, it's really important to note this. Um, we had no idea, and I think a lot of, from what I'm hearing, a lot of Mexican restaurants in the area had no idea what they were going to expect with Cinco de Mayo. Yes, it was you know besides Easter, it was the first big holiday, you know, national holiday that you want to call it, uh, where. It's literally known that people are going to go out and drink. On a normal circumstance, Cinco de Mayo is a huge holiday where literally everyone is out getting, or most people are out getting drunk and eating Mexican food, eating tacos, quesadillas, fajitas, nachos, whatever you want to call it, right? But we had no way of knowing whether people were actually going to celebrate the same way. One, because we're limited on what we can serve alcohol-wise, right? So my restaurant in Georgia, we're limited to bottles of beer and bottles of um, wine to go, but it's not like you can sit there in the parking lot and just throw some back and get hammered. So you're kind of limited with what you can do, you know, city by city and wherever, whatever state you're in. Um, but anyways, like I said, we had no idea what was going to happen, right? We ended up getting absolutely rocked. We got destroyed. Um, we weren't ready for it in any aspect of it, right? The staffing-wise, prep-wise, um, how we were going to handle our parking lot. Um, our parking lot we share with our sister restaurant, Papado, and we had cars wrapped all the way around our restaurant, into their restaurant, outside uh, of our driveway, all the way back up to the highway to the point where we couldn't do it anymore you know we had to actually shut down our online ordering system and um you know start to turn down phone calls right now if i was to say that i wasn't probably the most stressed out that i've ever been in my entire life uh, i would be lying to you but we survived we got through it um we learned a lot we learned a whole lot 
And I think that now, because of it, because of this huge hiccup, you know, assuming our guests understand that this isn't how things normally go, uh, they know that we'd usually execute at a very high level, that we might have dropped the ball this one day. Um, but for future for future uh, experiences, you know, I guarantee that we had definitely learned from it. Um, so, Lewis, how to you know how did you guys learn from it? Uh, we realized that on these higher volume days, at least for now, it's smarter to completely condense the menu to something to where you can efficiently execute. So for our for us, it's fajitas. Uh, we can cook a fajita less than five minutes. If you have chicken on the grill, um, the only exception to that would be our brochette shrimp, which I mean would take a little bit longer. But if we're having it on the grill and we're cooking it, and we're anticipating these orders, so we're, we weren't very smart with the online ordering versus the phone ordering. Um, we had no way of, uh, how do I say this? The method in which we were accepting online orders and phone orders wasn't, wasn't working for us. Um, so what we revised and worked out for Mother's Day was that we only had two platters, um, some in two things that we could execute efficiently so that our experience would go by a lot smoother. And I mean, it was night and day. I mean, this was probably like, it felt like a Monday shift, but we did, I mean, you know, we, we were projected and we exceeded expectations, right? So I think the preparation part of it is really important and making sure that you're smart enough to understand, okay, well, whatever we're doing right now isn't working, which is what we did. You know, we, we had to get nip in the butt real quick in order to figure it out. But for a day like, you know, Mother's Day where we expected to be busy, you know, I don't think any of our guests waited more than five minutes to get their food. The second, you know, we, the second we knew their order was getting ready to come up, you know, we had five orders ready to go up at the front we had a little walkie talkies. Hey, you know, John's here in the blue Civic. He had make, don't forget he had an extra queso. We already had the extra queso in the bag. Boom. You know, all they had to do was have one, one packer take the, the food, walk it out to the person in the front. That person walked it up to the guy in the car. There you go, sir. You already paid. You're good to go. Or, um, what we had also had going on, we had somebody in charge of the unpaid unpaid guests. So when the pet guest came in, hey, uh, you know, Jimmy is here. Uh, how long on his order? Oh, we're backing it up right now. So while that's going on, they're bringing the check in. They're running the check. By the time that you know our servers run the check, Jimmy's food's ready to go, and Jim, and he's walking out with the check and the food out. Less than five minutes, it was flawless. So being able to learn from your mistakes, super important. Uh, sometimes you got to get kicked in the butt in order to. Uh, make some changes, but you know, you're gonna have to make some changes in this COVID 19 world if you're gonna want to stay afloat, right? One thing that I really wanted to talk about, and I think it's really interesting, is how exactly does COVID 19 change restaurant management, specifically in the sickness department? Everyone who's in restaurants knows. You don't get a day off. There, there's no calling out sick. There's no, um, you know, no sick days. No nothing, right? If you're sick, and and I can speak from experience, you know, there have been instances when I've had either the flu or a really bad sickness, and I get sent home, you know, or I'll work a shift, and you know, I'll work until the point where my, you know, I'm looking like I'm gonna pass out, or I'm, I just really can't do it, and I gotta say, hey, boss. I can't do this. Like I, I really feel sick. They send you home. They say, "All right, you have go home, get some rest. We'll see you back tomorrow." If you have to work the next day, you have to be back the next day. So you don't really get much more than maybe eight, twelve, twenty-four hours to really recover and get over whatever flu or sickness you had before you have to go back to work in a very high volume restaurant, right? So that's the old restaurant model. No calling out, you know the, the 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 tough love aspect of it. I talked to my my GM, my my GM, my uh, I don't really really know what you call them there. For us, they're called concept leaders. For y'all, might be a district manager or whatever. But we were talking, and you know, back in the good old days, right? I walk up to you and I say, "Hey, GM, uh, 
I don't feel so good. I have a headache or uh, I feel like I'm coming down with the flu. He's going to say, all right, rub some dirt on it. Here's some Advil or here's some Dayquil or whatever. Get back to work, right? Or you wake up in the morning and you say, oh, shit, I'm not feeling good for this shift. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I got a headache or I'm not feeling good. Well, I better see you or you're not going to have a job, right? Because who's going to – you don't have the luxury to call out if, if you're in a restaurant because some of these restaurants are only operating with maybe four managers, including the GM. So if your closing manager calls out – Who's going to shut your restaurant down? Either someone's about to work a you know, full 18-hour shift or someone to come in on their day off. But, I mean, that this, this doesn't happen. You don't get the call out of restaurants, right? So now what happens when I call and I say, hey, I think I have a fever? You can't just tell me, oh, well, I better expect to see you at the restaurant because that's just a huge headache waiting to happen, right? All one reporter or one somebody has to hear is, hey, they made me come in at work and I had flu-like symptoms similar to COVID-19 or whatever. And now your restaurant probably getting shut down and you're probably having to deal with all kinds of headaches, right? So how do you, what do you do, right? That that's, uh, I don't have the answer for it, but this is a, I think it was a very interesting question or very interesting to think about because that is, has been the norm for years for restaurants is even if you're sick and dying, why don't you come on into the restaurant, see if you can work your shift, and if we're not busy, we'll send you home a little early, right? You tell it to servers all the time. I've said it. Everyone said it. Oh, yeah, you're sick, Susie. Um, well, why don't you come on in or try to get your shift covered, and then if you know we can, we'll cut you early. We'll send you home early, right? Can't do that anymore, all right? So I don't know what we're going to do, but something's going to have to change as far as the whole structure is concerned because, I mean – All it takes is one big mouth or just one person to walk out and say, hey, they made me come into work when I was sick, and now you can't get away with it anymore, right? Thanks to COVID-19, things have changed. And um, that brings me to cleanliness in the restaurant. I'm going to tell y'all a secret, and I, you know, I'm probably not supposed to tell you this secret. It's a right? But those health scores you see in the front of restaurants and the front of bars and everywhere where it says A, 100%, I guarantee you, none of those are actually really 100% accurate. Why am I saying that? Every single person that works in a restaurant understands that when the health inspector walks in and you see that man with the clipboard with the official badge and all that good stuff, your first instinct is first, get a manager, let somebody know so maybe they can stall them. But while they're stalling that person, everyone in the kitchen scrambling, every single dish, every single plate that could possibly be dirty, that was otherwise going to be you know, left there. Every single thing that that person can walk into is now getting thrown at the dish machine because technically, if the dishes are at the dish machine, then you can get by with saying, oh, well, we still have to wash those. Those aren't going to be actually used. While that, while all the commotion is going on, your cooks are putting ice on everything, even if it's not tempt, right? Because once that person gets that thermometer out, it's got to be at a certain temperature. If it's not there, then that's huge points taken off. And you don't want to get more than one um, temperature violation because that'll uh, that's huge for you, right? Um, so they're putting ice on everything. And if anything isn't the temp, I guarantee you it's going to the dish pit or they're throwing it away or something saying it's not in use, right? All operations stop. You start noticing everyone's washing their hands consistently and and as shitty as it is to say um i take a lot of pride in in where i work um we are probably the cleanest restaurant i I will i'm willing to bet and i'm willing to go toe to toe with any of your best restaurants and say that you walk into any papa's restaurant and it is going to be the cleanest restaurant you have ever been in your entire life but to say that we're not that that we're realistically washing our hands every time we come into the kitchen, every time we touch something, that that's just not true. 
what you hope is that you have enough systems in place to where um, it's a habit, right? So maybe not every time I come in the kitchen, but you're constantly washing hand because it's been drilled in my head during training that every time I walk in and I'm trying to do something, I'm washing my hands and I'm being clean. But not every restaurant is us. You know, I've also worked in plenty of restaurants, whether it be college or whatever, that you know, you see cooks that or, or, or dishwashers or whatever taking the same hands that they're throwing and scraping dishes off with and grabbing plates of food that people are probably about to eat. Like, you know, it's so not everywhere you go is, is as clean as that score says. But anyways, you know, while this is going on, whoever's expoing is now putting on gloves. They're probably not wearing gloves, right? So while the health inspector is there, yes, if you have a clean restaurant and you do these minor things to put things away, you're probably going to get an A. But if you're a really, really, really bad restaurant and you do those things, that really, really bad score that you normally would have got now turns into maybe a B or a low A where you can get away with how dirty your restaurant really is, right? And then what is your definition of dirty? Um, you know, are your floors cleaned? Are the, the backs of your fryers clean? Or are, are your actual fryers clean? Are your walls clean? Are you, you know, how does your restaurant look? I've been at some restaurants that the floors are filthy. There's, I mean, it, it, temperatures are all out of whack, but they still get that A. You know, I was a part, of, I'm not going to say I was part of a restaurant. And um, right when the guy walked in, I was able to convince him that I was a brand new manager and that I had no idea that uh, you shouldn't be dethawing shrimp in the hand sink. And um, he used it as a coaching opportunity for me, and we didn't lose points for that. But that's a really serious uh, point deduction, and that's a really serious you know, problem. If, if I was probably anybody else, or if I didn't get a lucky person that day who was feeling generous and nice because I was new, I could that A could have easily gone down to a C like that because you know I wasn't paying attention. So uh, there are ways around these things. So now there is no error for you know there is no there is no opportunity for error, right? You don't get a chance to give someone dirty silverware. You don't get a chance to uh, have a guest have a slight peek into your kitchen and see three servers not wash their hands when they come back out of the kitchen or to see somebody doing this and not wash their hands or no one's wearing a mask or, you know, vice versa or, you know, the worst that I guess that this would be the, one of the worst things that could happen to you is for somebody in your restaurant to actually get COVID-19 while you have guests in the restaurant, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you know, there are, there is zero chance, you know, you, to, for, for any kind of dirtiness in the restaurant. So Georgia has reopened all of its, well, not all of it, but Georgia's reopened or, or said that restaurants can now open uh, the dining room floors. Got to follow certain, you know, certain guidelines. But for the most part, I think very, very minimal amount of restaurants reopened that very first day. Everyone was kind of playing that cat and mouse game to see, okay, well, who's going to open first? And, you know, we're going to see how they're going to do it first. And we're going to figure out what's working for them. And then we'll do our dining room for maybe a day after, right? Or just see if maybe they're doing what we were thinking about doing, right? So it was really interesting to see kind of how all that played out. What I will say is those first restaurants, um, the first restaurants to open, those are the real troopers because they're now in charge of basically setting the tone for every other restaurant. They're the brave ones on the on the front lines taking that first charge and, you know, should something go wrong, they're the ones that are going to take all the heat for it. Um no one wants to be that first restaurant that has the confirmed case of COVID-19 while the dining room is open. But eventually, I'm assuming it's going to happen. Um, so what are we going to do or what are you know what, what should restaurants do in order to make sure that 
if that does happen to them, they've got systems in place to basically, you know, prove that it might have been a freak accident, that they did everything they could and everything in their power to make sure that everyone in that restaurant is safe. There was a restaurant group in the Black Sheep Restaurants uh, in Hong Kong. They released a 17-page PDF file basically uh, outlining what they were doing to uh, protect their guests and to make sure that every single one of their guests and staff members were safe you know, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic and how they were going to take, how they were going to reopen their restaurant. Uh, main focus obviously was on hygiene and uh, socially, social distancing their guests. Um, so a couple of the mandated hygiene practices across the board, hand washing every 30 minutes, hand sanitizer and wipes to be made available absolutely everywhere. Uh, make masks available and mandatory for all. Scheduled sanitizing of all shared surfaces every 30 minutes. Increased cleaning across the board with uh, an external agency deep sanitation every 10 days. And the banned physical contact, no handshakes, high fives, fist bumps. Now I think that some of the stuff outlined in here is a little extreme. Uh, I'll go through more of it late in a second, but uh, yes, hand washing consistently is a key, right? We want to make sure that we're being uh, very clean and extra cautious when we're uh, in the restaurant. Um, some things that I heard people were doing, replacing salt and pepper shakers, because there's no real way to, I guess, you can't really figure out a way to, to properly clean san uh, salt and pepper shakers and whatnot. So they're just taking them off the tables completely, replacing them with sanitizer and wipes, which I think is a great idea. Should somebody want salt and pepper, you get a little packet, you'll bring it out to them and then, okay? Um, there's no need to further contamination by having that there. Um, making masks available and mandatory for all. There was actually a uh, Hillstone restaurants, um, from what I heard, and I read an article not too long ago, um, that and actually somebody was uh, let me see if I can pull it up in Dallas uh, someone from was suing the Hillstone restaurants group because their company policies prevented any kind of mass being worn in the restaurant um, so long story short the server or cook I believe it was wanted to wear a mask but the company policy um, said no, uh, that it's against the dress codes, and they would they would reduce that person's hours until they decided they wanted you know that they wouldn't wear the mask, um, which is outrageous, right? When everyone when everyone's telling you to wear masks, they decided to say no because of company policy, and I believe, you know, I, I believe it only because uh, here in Atlanta they're very strict on their uh, no large party policy. And uh, rapper T.I., um, for those of you guys from Atlanta, you, you already know, uh, he, I guess he tried to go to the, uh, the restaurant Houston's here in Atlanta and with the party, I think it was like eight, and they said no parties larger than, larger than six. So he said, okay, let's, can we break up into two parties of four? They're going to pay for them, and I'm going to pay for this group. Like We're going to be completely separate. We just wanted to be together. And they said no. So, you know, not real, I guess not realizing that he was probably one of Atlanta's biggest rappers. Uh, protest started and ended up shutting the restaurant down. So they're very strict and they're very on their um, policies. But anyways, this isn't a Bash Hillstone uh, podcast. Um, so yeah, the importance of being the first one to be open. Um, you know, th th those of you who are opening first... Um, should really look at this this guideline. Um, let me get back into it real quick. Health. This is a big one. Uh, this is, we're actually doing this at our restaurant. Uh, preparing for the worst and finding out where the hospitals and clinics at, so you can send your staff. Um, we're taking temperatures, so we have a little um, thermometer that it's like it scans your head, I guess, or whatever. It does a heat signature or some. That's a fancy thermometer. But we're tempting all of our staff members, we're tempting all the managers to make sure that one, no one comes in with a fever. Two, uh, they ha every ma everyone in the restaurant has to wear a mask, whether that's inside or outside. And uh, when we clock in, uh, there's a notice saying that, you know, we understand that 
the symptoms of COVID-19 and that should we be feeling any of these symptoms, immediately let a manager know so that we can be removed from the building. Um, so invest, investing in that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some other things that these guys were doing, uh, they are putting up plexiglass in to divide all their booths up that they have, and they're also socially they're putting our, their tables six feet apart, which I think is really smart, which is what we're doing as well, I believe, whenever we just had to open the, re the dining room floor. Um, so I think it's a great a tool to use, uh, blacksheeprestaurants.com. Uh, look for their, uh, it's, it's, I think it's called the COVID-19, uh, it's called the COVID-19 Playbook. All right, so make sure you take a look at that because I think it's, it'd be very beneficial for you to at least take a look at it. Um, so our restaurants are reopening. How does the dining room look now that we have reduced our tables in half? We no longer have a bar because you, you can't really social distance at the bar. Um, you know, what does it look like? What does my experience look like from the beginning? Before I even get into that, I, I think it's really important to continue to push the curbside um, orders, continue to, to push people to not eat in the restaurant, at least for the next couple of months. I, I know it's a lot to ask for, and I know it's probably not the most economical thing to do, right? But I think in the long run, it's going to be what the guests remember the most, that, that you actually you know went above and beyond to make sure that they were safe. But should you decide to reopen the, the dining room floor, how does it all look? Because you can't have people waiting in the front anymore. So what are we doing? Are we asking guests to stay in their car? Are we maybe moving them to the patio? Are we having, you know, we're not going to have them stand six, you know, six feet apart. That's going to get pretty, a pretty long line. Um, I think the best bet is to put them in their cars and say, okay, sir, you know, we'll, we'll shoot you a text or I don't even know how you would do it, but we'll call you when, you're, when your table is ready or we'll buzz you with our little buzzer um, so you get your guests in slowly. Uh, ooh, I would also really encourage uh, reservations. That way you know, one, how many folks are coming into your restaurant, two, Put those folks on priority. I, I think now is the time to say no. Now is the time to be a little picky. So, you know, if you were to do reservations only, for, for example, now you know exactly who's coming into your restaurant at what time. Um, and you can go about making sure that you're spacing them out. You have enough food for them. Um, you can call them. You know, slowly, okay, sir, your table's ready, your reservation's for 8 o'clock, space it out, 8 o'clock, 8.05, whatever you want to do it. Um, I think reservations would be huge. But so, you know, you walk in. Now I'm going to sit at my table. Are our servers wearing masks? Are our servers having, you know, easy access to sanitation? Um, are we adding more bussers to our staff so that we can clean these tables faster? Um, I hope yes. Uh, restroom checks, uh, sanitation checklists. You know, you have to, you know, have proof that you're sanitizing your restaurants every 15, 30 minutes, however you're going to do it, and have someone dedicated solely to cleaning and sanitizing the the, the high, vo you know, high volume points. That's the front door, the bathroom doors, um, any area where the servers are congregating and touching, um, menus. Right, maybe switching to paper menus so you can throw it away quickly. I, I, I think uh, I forget who it was. They were doing the the QR codes for the menus, so you can just walk, look at the menu on your phone. Um, get creative with it. I don't know. So doing things like that. Large parties. So my restaurant is a, is a prime example of a a restaurant that I don't know that will suffer. I don't, don't want to use the word suffer, but we're built to execute large parties. And by large parties, I don't mean parties of eight. I don't mean parties of 10. But my restaurant is geared towards being able to accommodate parties of 20, parties of 30. We, I've, we've done parties of 40 before um, with a full restaurant as well. And so I'm talking a, a party of 40 walking on a Saturday night that we can be able to accommodate them and a restaurant that seats, I think it has like maybe 30 something tables or whatever. I mean, uh, to, to get, uh, I don't really know how much it is, but 
Anyways, we're built for large parties. So can't do that anymore. You know, uh, on top of spacing the tables out, you can't really do, we're not pushing tables together anymore. So I think we're, you know, you have to cap it at what our biggest table is six. So for those, uh, some other restaurants, you are about to have to get very comfortable saying no. All right. And if the word no isn't in your vocabulary, I suggest you look it up and start learning it because in a world where we always say the guests come first, um, unfortunately, I think now we're going to have to turn down a lot more guests. Um, what do I mean by that? In, in this article that, that I was talking about for the Black Sheep restaurants, they talk about, you know, on their first day, they turned down, I think it was 50 people. Because at the front door, when they got temped, they were over. They had a fever. They just told those guests, no, we're sorry, we're not letting you in. They also are making their guests sign, like, health waivers, which I think that's a little extreme. But, um, yeah, what do you do? You get this guest that comes in and they got a fever. And you tell them no. And now you've got... A very angry guest that says, I feel fine. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Do you risk the safety of your staff and the rest of the guests in the restaurant for that one guest? Or do you say no and send them home and say, sorry, sir, we're going to have to send you home? It's a very uncomfortable situation. But I I think it's something that we're going to have to do. If you think about it, it's no different than cutting somebody off, which is a very uncomfortable thing to do, if you're, especially if you're a brand new manager. But um, we're just going to have to figure out, and you're going to have to do it. Yeah? And I think saying no also comes into play with the bar. Um, I am currently the beverage manager, and I have a very large background and a very strong passion for uh, the beverage area of things. So it really breaks my heart to think that even when we reopen dining room floors, whether that's in our restaurant or you know other restaurants here in the Atlanta area, the bar area that I've known to love and to really appreciate and to, you know I spent a lot of time building our bar um, and putting my people in the place and to make sure that we're executing at a high level and our liquor cost is low and we're cranking out drinks and my staff is making money and you know the restaurant's making money. Uh, it really breaks my heart that I'm going to walk into the restaurant pretty soon and see a half full restaurant and an empty bar. Uh, it really, It really kills me. But there is no way to socially distance at the bar top. We have 25 bar stools at our bar. Even if I were to take all 25 of those bar stools and maybe bring it down to five, space it out. Let's say I had enough space to space it out. Do you really think that on a Saturday night or you know, you get some family of four or five that comes in and you get... You know, you got John Q over here in the corner, eating his food, minding his own business by himself, you know, socially distancing, not bothering anybody. And, you know, right now we're on a wait, so these frat boys come up, all four of them, and they want their beer. And they happen to pick the spot right next to Mr., what I say his name was, John. Well... There goes your whole social distancing, right? And now, John's uncomfortable. John says to the guys, Hey guys, uh, would you mind scooting over a little bit? And it's like, well, we're going to set the bar. You know, you're, you are going to have those guests who are going to say, Don't suck into the media. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, you're an idiot. I'm going to do what I want. It's my right to sit at this bar. And it's completely their right to sit at the bar if they wanted to. But as a restaurant operator, as a restaurant manager... You have to have your guests' safety in mind. So should that happen, you know, 
you're going to have to walk up to that guest and say, sir, I'm either going to have to ask you to move over a little bit more or I'm going to have, have to ask you to leave. So I think in order to just completely avoid that situation, it's just smarter to not even put the seats there. Don't even give them the opportunity to do that, you know? Um, but what's that, you know, what's it going to look, what's the bar top going to look like now? I'm assuming, you know, those of you restaurants that have service bartenders, that's all you're going to have. Do you put plexiglass up in front of the service bar area or do you just leave it the same? I don't know. But that interaction between the server and the service bartender and even the, the bartender and the guest, there, there really isn't a way for you to safely separate the bar top because the, you know, the whole reason you sit at the bar is for that experience. If the experience can't be given to you 100%, then you know, you, there, there, there's no reason to go to the bar. You can't, you can't watch sports, right? Even if you have five, six TVs, there's no sports going on. Um, we don't want our staff in front of our guests for that long. So then now they're just sitting at a bar top by themselves. Why not just do it at the table? You go to the bar for the experience. And I always tell my bartenders this, you are the cheapest psychiatrist in the world. People go up to you to talk to you about you know, how great their day's going, how bad their day's going. You're there to listen. You can't sit there and listen if uh, you're being encouraged to stay away from your guest. So... As much as it breaks my heart, I think for the next couple of months, there won't even be a bar top. So now I have, now we have to figure out how to, con not convince, but do you pay that service bartender hourly, right? And if you do, think about it this way. Your bartenders are usually your most experienced, your best you know, staff members. They're accustomed to making a lot of money. I, mean, I know my bartenders are. So I think the way I was able to motivate them to work a service barship, which is an hourly pay, so for at least for us, I don't know how it is in mo other restaurants, but for us, our service bartender gets paid uh, hourly. And then the rest of the bartenders don't tip them out or anything like that. They're just making two thirteen an hour and their tips. Um, now... These service bartenders, service bartenders are also regular bartenders, so they're making tips throughout the week as well, and maybe they're serving, picking up shifts, or they're working banquets or whatever. The amount of money they accumulate in tips is so much to where that service bar check, that hourly check, is now gone. That, that check becomes um, zero because they don't even see a paycheck. It gets all taken out of taxes. So... Now we have to find somebody who's willing to either work hourly um, or you put a manager back there because now you know the execution of drinks is going to be very important. You don't have the opportunity to remake that drink, so you got to make sure that drink is made perfectly. Um, and you also want to make sure that the sanitation practices behind the bar because you are handling so many different things. You're touching bottles. You're touching um, the faucets. You're going in the kitchen, you're touching food, you're doing all kinds of stuff. You know, so you want to make sure that the whoever's there in that position is a trusted person and a high leadership position because should they screw up, you're front and center. Everyone's watching. You know, the, the best thing about the bar is all lies are always on you in a, in a negative way or a positive way. So hopefully let's make it a, a positive way. So I think with one of the saddest things to think about, and this is just my opinion, and this will happen, but chain restaurants are going to be fine. You know, they, they have enough money, they're large enough to be able to operate um, during all this pandemic, even if they do end up closing maybe half of their restaurants. The other half of the restaurants that they have open are going to do well enough to be able to support that company, right? The same can't be said for these smaller mom and pop restaurants. Uh, I actually just read the other earlier today. Um, one of Atlanta's local favorites, the Blacksican, started out with a food truck. Food truck 
absolutely blew up. It, it's a soul food Mexican. It's like a mixture of Mexican and soul food. Um, the food truck blew up. They opened up their own location. Um, and recently, they decided they were going to close down. Uh, when they were asked why they decided to make the close, um, the owners told uh, Eater Atlanta he made the decision to close the restaurant following the governor's announcement to allow restaurants to reopen for dine-in service at the end of April. Uh, the vast majority of Turner's business at the restaurant, which he says is around 90%, come from the weekday workforce from nearby offices during lunch. According to Turner, most of the corporate businesses in the area remain closed. The cost to continue opening the restaurant, including rehiring the staff, didn't add up. So instances like this are going to cause a lot of our favorite mom and pop restaurants to shut down. Um, and I think that's probably going to last a year, you know, at least. So, who knows if they'll even reopen, right? We're lucky he has the food truck and he's still operating on all four cylinders with that. But you think about it, a lot of these smaller restaurants are, are relying on these businesses, right? Being close to a, a business park. Now, you don't get that traffic anymore because everyone's working from home or most people are still working from home. So that flow of traffic isn't coming through. You can't afford it. Another big thing is the price of food is going up. Less folks are buying it, right? So now prices go up. Take something like a, like a Mexican restaurant. It, you customary to expect chips and salsa. And uh, for the most part, can't really have a Mexican restaurant if you have guacamole, right? Avocados and tomatoes, are two probably it's probably two of the most expensive things you can buy that aren't like steak and protein, right? So, how do you get away with selling? You know, because right now I, I don't know how it is in other states, but I've actually never eaten Mexican rest Mexican food in another state but Georgia. But here, at least, chips and salsa is free. Even if I buy just dessert. I could sit down at my table and I could go through four bowls of salsa if I wanted to, right? That ain't cheap. We're, th we're throwing away this, this salsa, basically, um, and we're not getting any money back from that. So that's a lot of money gone in the garbage. And if I were to tell my guest, well, I guess this goes back to having to say no. Or, I mean, having to take a drastic change. We're going to have to either raise our prices and piss off some of our guests that are accustomed to whatever prices you have uh, to stay, you know, to stay afloat uh, or we're going to shut down. Um, a lot of these smaller places, oh man, I mean, you got rent coming up. Um, there's just so many factors to think about that I just don't think these smaller restaurants are going to be able to do it. Um, and even if, even if you are, you're having to shrink down your menu, right? Already, so your margins are already, are, are just shrinking as we go. And then a lot of these places have a minimal amount of staff. So what if your staff doesn't even want to come back, right? What if you decide to reopen your dining room floor, and you only have, you know, you're, you're small enough to where you only have ten servers in your whole restaurant? and maybe 10 back of house staff. What if those guys don't want to come back? You're either about to have to ask four of your people to work ridiculous hours, right? Or you're going to have to try to find somebody and retrain them. And training ain't cheap. You know, the, the, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but I think it, it cost us somewhere around like $1,000 to train a server. Per server. That's if they finish their entire training process. That's books, uniforms, um uh training meals training paying the paying the server that's training them back of house front house whatever you know it ain't cheap to train somebody either so all of that really does come into play so i think that because of all that there's going to be a significant amount of these small restaurants that are going to close and and, and it's that really sucks to hear um you know, there's going to be a lot of places, if you think about it, 
that you really wanted to try that you're probably never going to get to try. But on the bright side, I think this really does bring out some competition amongst these smaller restaurant chains. You know, which one of you, are, you know, who is going to change their model, whether that's curbside, implementing delivery services, uh, rewards programs, you know, whatnot, to make sure that you're bringing guests in and you're attracting people to come to your restaurant as opposed to, you know, the one down the road. Um, so I think it's really, it's really fun. As sad, as sad of a time as it is, I think it's the best part about this is that it's bringing out a lot of creativity. And I think even after all this is over and we're reopened and, you know, America's forgotten about COVID-19 and we're back to normal, I don't think a lot of these uh, new programs we've put in, in place are going to go away. Uh, the curbside model definitely here to stay, um, which I think is really cool. Uh, being able to maybe separate a curbside area, walking food out uh, efficiently, being able to up your to-go sales. I think people realize the importance of to-go sales and how easy, not how easy, but should you have a, pl uh, a plan in place to execute on to go, I think people realize that there's a lot of money to be made on that side. I think I think we we become so focused on the dining room and the bar and everything else that we completely ignore to go, and we completely ignore the revenue center that that can actually be. So I think it's really cool that if you know those restaurants that do stay alive and or stay open. Now is the time to experiment. Now is the time to really get that to-go system in place because should you get it right, I guarantee you when things go back to normal, you're now 15 steps ahead of the game and you've already got that loyalty from the guests that have been sticking with you this entire time. And that's just going to continue to build and build and build and build until you have a very dominant to-go program. Either way... Um, we got some crazy times ahead of us. We're going to be doing a lot of trial and error, a lot of learning to be done. Um, a lot of us are going to fail. A lot of us are going to succeed. But I think the most important thing is, I think what's really cool, before I finish up, I want to say how proud I am to be a part of this industry. This is, I always say, this is probably, besides working in Wall Street, got to be the most stressful job you can probably ever have. Uh, dealing with as many people as we deal with, um, the hours that we work, um, the stress we go through, um, working every holiday, you know, sacrificing time with your family, sacrificing time with your friends, not get not getting to go to that game you wanted to go to or watch this movie you wanted to watch because you had to work to see this industry come together the way it has during this pandemic i think should really show you one the importance of the hospitality industry but two just how awesome people really are man um a lot like i said a lot of these small restaurants might go out of business but the fear of going out of business hasn't stopped them from uh, giving back to their community. You know, you're seeing a lot of these restaurant groups and a lot of these restaurants, uh, local restaurants, giving back to our local healthcare professionals, our police officers, our firefighters, our homeless shelters. They're, you know, they're just trying to figure out a way to best utilize the food they have in their restaurants. I think, you know, in the beginning, donating cooking meals for other service member you know service member people um you know there were plenty of restaurants here in atlanta who were doing meals for any hospitality people who had lost their jobs um you know in times like this for us to be able to come together i think is really amazing so uh you know yay restaurant people uh, um but 
regardless of what you try to do, the emphasis has to be on safety and sanitation. That's your guests and your staff. Because now, more than ever, you know, um, you're going to get critiqued on everything. Okay, if somebody sees dust in your restaurant, they're going to associate it with you being dirty. Guests are going to be very, very sensitive to hygiene. All right, um, there, there's talk of some restaurants take installing the the touchless uh, hand washers in the bathrooms, all that stuff. Investing a lot of money in their you know new air circulation systems and their AC vents and all that stuff. So whatever you do, one, I, I recommend you highlight it to your guests, what you're doing to make sure that they're safe. But two, uh, don't be afraid to push the box. You know, like we talked about, not being afraid to say no, turning down guests that have fevers, turning down staff members that have fevers, um, you know, telling your guests, hey, you can't push that table together because now that table is going to be way too close to this table. Um, being able to think on the fly and being able to best maneuver your restaurant for one, efficiency, being able to profit because none of this works if you're not making money, if you're not open. So you have to figure out exactly how many people, how many you know, guests you have to serve, where the best place to position these tables, should you open your patio, how do you serve alcohol? We didn't even get into alcohol. Um, how do you push beer? How do you push liquor? How are you going to, you know, try to replicate some sort of bar sales, right? Liquor, beer, and wine sales at the tabletop if your servers are spending less time in front of the guests, if you can't do tabletop presentations, if you can't, you know, uh, I don't know, um, you know, whatever. But I think. It all comes down to time, you know. We, we don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen the day after that. Cases could rise to unprecedented levels and our president decides to shut, you know, everything down all over again and, you know, everything I'm saying just goes to shit, you know. We don't, doesn't even work. But what I can say is now is a great time to learn, you know. Uh, I'm constantly learning at our restaurant. You know, my, my buttons are definitely being pushed. Uh, you know, if I, I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I was stressed out, that this does kind of suck, you know, because not only if, if you're a decent human being, you realize that it's not just about you. You know, you've got staff members that haven't been making money for a long time. You know, servers who are accustomed to making x amount of dollars a week are going to you know whatever their unemployment is so the humanities out of it you want rest you want to reopen you want to be able to go back to normal but the reality of it is it's probably going to be a while and even if it does go back to normal it won't be the same so we're going to have to adjust like we always do we're going to have to um, innovate and if you don't innovate you know your doors probably will be closed but I think it's a it's a interesting time and a very exciting time to be restaurant operator restaurant manager um, as bad as, as it is to say I think there's a lot of opportunity that comes out of all this you know should a lot of these smaller restaurants end up closing that just means that when the next wave hits it's gonna be a lot of eager people ready to go with new ideas, new concepts, purchasing restaurants, uh, and bringing us back to the, the normal. Um, but, you know, I'm done for the day. Time for me to go to bed. Thank you all again so much for listening. Don't forget, you can catch the full podcast on YouTube and uh, Facebook. And you can also catch the audio version on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. You can also catch us on Instagram at Happy Hour Podcast and on Twitter at Happy Hour Podcast. I will link everything down here below. Um, don't forget to give us a follow, guys. 
Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm Louis Q. Y'all stay safe. Take care.